Hey, welcome, welcome to this week's week four already of Rise the Podcast. It's the weekly podcast that really intends to bring positive change to the world. It's the podcast that defends the small business owner, uh, that honors creativity, new ideas, problem solving, independent critical thinking, finding a new path and a way with passion. And of course, if you're an entrepreneur, a little bit of blood, sweat and tears to make it all happen. And each week we feature great guests who are making a difference for good, whether it's how we do business, leading at work, making communities stronger, eradicating poverty, touting abundance, or new ways to heal or be healthy, or empowering youth to be all they can be, as well as honoring and learning from our elders. This show is a journey of ideas, solutions, and new thinking that will have us and have you create a vision for who you want to be, and where we want to be collectively. And our guest today is the amazing Sarah Phoenix, who um, I did a pre-sort of uh, call with last week. Uh, And Sarah Phoenix has a big background in social enterprises, like her former one, Mencedora, and now she heads up Eco Homesteader. And you're just on the verge of of, uh, your big launch uh, coming up. And also, Sarah is passionately connected to soul holding true to her mission to help and support all people. After spending 15 years as a PSW, she expanded her medical knowledge to become a licensed RMT in London, combining her love of medicine and her connection to the earth. She now focuses on natural remedies and self-responsible healing methods. She believes that our true survival is based on self-sufficient and account of being accountable for our own well-being. Uh, I I can't agree more. Sarah freely uh, gives her knowledge and tools so we can create a society that's healthy, free-thinking communities. A strong problem solver, she doesn't stand for injustices or inequalities, especially when it comes to our youngest generation. So we share that in common because I do a lot of work with youth entrepreneurs. Um, She's also um, combines years of experience in management, Um, The word impossible is not in her vocabulary. Starting a rebellion that truly supports people has been swirling in her mind for a few years now, and all finally are the missing pieces are in place. Now, if not now, when? Which is a great question. If not now, when? She is ready to step up to the plate and be a leader in the movement we're about to discuss today. Welcome, Sarah Phoenix, to the uh, Rise the Podcast. So Great. well, thank you for having. Me. Uh, it's a, it's a pleasure. Like I was so in, interested uh, when we spoke last week. I went, oh yeah, I got to book you. So um, <laughs> you're literally stepping up to the plate, literally, and um, you're doing that uh, through some really very different initiatives that you and your team are involved with, uh, and that that is around the idea of food security to a point where. You're teaching families to be able to grow their own food and have the skills to do so. Why do you feel that's important right now? Well, I think one of the things is, is that we see a lot of division happening in our country. And, you know, we're seeing prices rise. We're seeing crop failures. We're seeing climate change issues. We're seeing all kinds of variables that kind of lead us and funnel into a food issue. And food is the one thing that brings all opinions together. It's the one thing everybody needs to survive with. It's the fundamental thing for human bodies to work. So when you feel better, you can make better choices. It's you know been proven someone with a healthy diet can have a better outlook on life. And especially with all these trying times right now, having the healthiest version of people will ensure that they can make good choices as well as it's, it's, it's kind of like the breaking of bread, I say. It's like, it doesn't matter what side of the fence you're sitting on, you can come together because it's feeding our families and and nutrients. And it's something so easy. It's something so easy that we've forgotten how to do because we've become so disconnected from our food sources. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny, just I've been noticing, I don't watch a lot of TV, but when I do, it's very select programming. And the ads I see for food are all junk, junk food related. Right. Which is really, um, really sad, you know, that, that we're putting hamburgers with bacon and, you know, cheese and, and, and then the bread's got the carbs and, 
may not even you know it's well, white white flour so all these things right. are 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 being um pitched to us and 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 people are buying obviously and then it's got there's no nutritional value you well, know? and it seems like such a strange thing to be happening when we're trying to do things that boost our immune system. You know, mm -hmm. we have uh, this thing going on with everyone where we, we're concerned about getting sick, but they're not promoting anything about, you know, our nutrition, our vitamins, like the things that we can use to keep our vessels healthy. It's almost like totally counterproductive. It's almost like here, like keep your immune system down, keep your, you know, your system under attack as it tries to digest these foods. Yeah. And, you know, the other critical piece to what you're doing is you're teaching people, well, how to how to grow their own food with the geo um, biodomes. Um, tell us a bit about this and, and, you know, like, where did the idea come from? How did you come across this? And, and what's your goal moving forward with you know, either people coming together and growing their own food in communities, maybe like, you know, another uh, aspect of community gardens. And also, again, why this is going to, you know, potentially help us um, manage our own supply of, of, of food and also to be uh, have healthier, more nutritional, closer to the ground right. sources. <laughs> Right. So the idea actually has been a long time coming. We, we've we traveled, we lived in the jungles of Vietnam and we lived in the jungles of the Yucatan in Mexico, running an off-grid eco-village there. And, you know, we've done other things that have kind of led up to this alternative building, alternative um, diets and things like that, right? So what we noticed is, is that people really, as I mentioned, have lost disconnect on how they can connect to food. And they don't even know how to do simple things like sprouting or, or microgreens or stuff that can be done with no light and very little water. So the concept that we've basically created is to ensure that everybody can thrive and survive. And, you know, it's one thing just to survive in darker days. And it's another thing to actually be doing it healthy and well and feeling good about yourself. So the concept with the Eco Home Center actually started pretty much when um, the pandemic started. And we were really concerned about the things that were happening and things we were witnessing. We do try to keep as much political stuff out of our program. We just really focus on that, like coming together with food. But the thing that we're noticing is with so many climate change issues, people are having a hard time with frost, with rain, with unusual weather, with wind. Like we're seeing this again. Fires out west all summer. Oh, yeah. And even up here where we are in, in New Liskard, like we've had monsoon rains and crops are being tilled under. So geodomes are incredible for the sense where they require very little wood. They can be made out of all kinds of different things. They are very easy to construct and they are uh, very strong geometrically against the wind. They've been designed and in, in around for centuries. Um, great mathematicians had sorted that out, uh, you know, a long time ago for their strength. So the concept is, is for us to get these domes to people that have the space and this will allow them to extend their growing season through the winter as well as to avoid other issues such as animals and, and things like that that can destroy a crop and especially with seed saving if you only have a limited number of seeds and you lose a whole crop that's not only disheartening but it's a potential issue for for survival so the eco homesteader is we are fully grassroots we are just a group of people that believe that when you find something that you love you give it to the world freely and in return you get everything you need so and that's really how we started we have seen these domes in action we know that we could recreate them and we knew that we could bring them to a, a wide public by using what we do best which is like reusing and reducing and and repurposing things so these particular domes range in any, anywhere from like 10 feet up to 30 they can go up to 50 feet actually for a larger community and what we have happening is is people have donated large acreages of forest and we go in and we're going to be milling them with alaskan mills or we have people donating mills um, and things like that. Some of our domes do require some stamped lumber because of the size, but we are very resourceful. And what we do is we are a licensed business, but we actually don't make any profit and we don't take any income. We only have the license so that we can actually get stuff at wholesale and be able to apply for grants and things like that through the social enterprise kind of form. And that's where a lot of our experience comes in is being resourceful and really kind of crowdsourcing 
um, this kind of this kind of movement that we're trying to do. And, and that's why we call it a rebellion. It's almost rebellious to say, hey, I want to give you a free dome. I want to create a learning platform, which we did called Spectrum, that's going to teach you everything you need. And we're going to help you from seed to plate. So that's not just even like the seeds, getting you the seeds, but how do you process it? How do yeah. you garden it? How do you cook it? How do you preserve it? These are skills we've lost along the way. Our kids don't know how to do any of this. Our adults don't so know either. Be, me being one no. of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's and it's overwhelming. And it's overwhelming information, right? So, and that's really what we're we're doing. So we are creating a platform where we will have hubs in every area with a hub leader, and the hub basically takes care of that area, not just for seeds. But maybe, maybe you are losing your job for a reason and you can't get your kids clothes. Well, our hubs will have a setup where donated clothes can go and you can go, you can go shopping for clothes for your kids. So it's about all aspects of survival, not just food security, but it's, uh, we have people donating workshops and time and teachers creating uh, homeschooling stuff. So it's, it's a huge project, but we have so many people involved and so many people stepping up to the plate to help us. And, and it's really about, you know, community coming together and working together to make, uh, to, to, to be our brother's keeper kind of thing. Is that part Absolutely. of your mission at Echo Homesteader? Is that, is that your, you know, your, one of your underlying missions for the organization? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think one thing that has happened since 2020 is we've, we've became afraid of our neighbor. We've became mm. afraid of of connecting with people and, you know, really hearing their stories or, you know, we're just afraid. And this is something we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to connect again. And it doesn't matter, as I said, if you are on one side or on another side, um, we, we really don't discriminate. We know that everybody needs support right now. So it doesn't matter uh, what your, what your belief system is. It's just about getting people to come together um, regardless of, you know, anything that you might believe in. So yes, we are trying to get people to come together in a community and to create something where you can rely on your neighbor, but also skill share. And, and that's what we're hoping each hub will do. Like each hub will have the ability to have like a welder or, you know, whatever they need or a nurse or a doctor, you know, these sort of things really, really client focused almost like when I think back to my medical, my medical time, it's like really handholding, handholding one-on-one -on -one support. Yeah, you're outside, right? <laughs> I, I have like flies in here. Like I'm like, uh, it's flies where we are. So I'm like, I got them everywhere right now. Oh right? boy, I know. I, I, we're, I, we're in the bus. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Well, maybe we'll get to that. We'll see. We'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you, you, you know, you alluded to the past 18 months and the cost it, uh, on humanity, lost jobs. Uh, I don't mean to be bleak or paint a bleak bleak picture mm -hmm. but you know if humanity is going to take it to another level we really do have to step up a notch and come together and be more in community and be our brothers and sisters keepers if you will um do you do you, do you feel that what you're doing that 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 will contribute to, to that sort of movement? Is that what the movement or the rebellion is about? And the other thing I also want to ask you is I've read and heard that the vibration of love and togetherness and harmony is, is greater than the vibration of the thing we're trying to uh, ward off, the, the virus, right. as it were. What's your take on, on both of those? Well, you know, I think the one thing that I've noticed since we've really launched this movement is that we hear tons of message. I get hundreds of message a day. Like I have hope now. Oh my God, I can't believe I had so much darkness. I was so depressed and now I have hope. So I think that this mission that we have happening is actually someone stepping up and doing something, actual physical stuff, like where we have tangible evidence that we are doing things. We're not just talking or, you know, um, we're actually doing something. And so I see that it's giving people hope. It's giving people the abilities and tools to make better choices and to take control of their lives. And, you know, you're totally right. Like the, the heart chakra runs at 432 Hertz and, you know, some of the fear chakras, they run much lower. I think 235 is root chakra. Um, I might be slightly off with that, but it's a different Hertz system. Right. And 
love will always win. It always does. And I think that that's the one thing I know about what's happening right now is we need this. And I know that might sound horrible to say, but our system is so broken how we interact with people. This is going to allow us to recreate and change what we don't like and create a world that we do like, where we are like supporting each other. We're going back to community. We're creating villages. You know, we're really taking out the consumerism and go more towards just the love and support. So, you know, I maybe I might be like the odd man out here, but I see this as a really beautiful moment, right? Where we get the chance to rewrite our history. And yeah. that's and that keeps us and that's how we communicate, right? That's my cell phone. Yeah, yeah. You know, that that's very personal, don't you find? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, yeah, and it doesn't it, it doesn't build bridges or or biodomes or it doesn't build communities. No, 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 it doesn't. And I mean, we get lots of questions, too. Like, how do we how are we able to do this as a grassroots movement? Yeah. And it's how? really well, it's the community coming together. We are running a program called or a, a fundraiser, what we call the uh, one dollar one voice pledge. Yeah. Um, and ba basically it's to say that one voice is very small. One dollar is very small. But for every dollar, as you know, as people donate, that turns into a very large voice. And what we do here is we're totally transparent. We, we post all of our bank statements. You can see the money coming in, see the money coming out. And everything we buy is to do things like Alaskan mills or, um, you know, to cover permits for domes or the things that we need to like to retrofit the bus, for example, that we have, as well as some of the other things that are like the financial costs that we can't get donated. But I mean, we have incredible people that have skills that are offering all kinds of stuff for us. And that's how this movement happens is by these donations. And these domes aren't like super luxury domes. There's some really great companies that make those here in Ontario. These domes are utilitarian. They are anchored to the ground so they can move very easily if you have to relocate or, or you're moving or whatever your circumstances are. Um, they have different kinds of covering between plastic and polycarb wood you can actually live in these um as another option and we're offering all of our plans open source so that'll be showing up on our website soon everything we do is free like out there for everybody right and for those who are wondering a biodome what, what, what are they what do they look like it's like the monkey bars in a playground at yes. school uh with yeah. with the then like some sort of tarp uh covering right okay. and and sure. but um, you, you also have heaters that you supply and coolers. Right. So this, the covering is not going to melt or catch fire. Uh, one would hope. No. Um, so, no, no, no. so talk, talk to us about the, the, the geodome technology. What, what are the origins and what are some of the benefits to these? So with the domes, they've been, this design has been around for a very, very long time. There's mm. some ginormous domes all over the place. Um, the domes can be heated. The great thing is, is you can grow stuff year round in them and we can use a wood burning stove, but we can also use mass rocket heating stoves, which is just using like some tubing and clay. You can also use compost heating. This is where all of our alternative building and gardening and all these things that are going on that we, we've learned over the course of our time come into play. Um, so they keep a consistent temperature because if you have a square or a rectangle, you're going to have cold spots in the corner because the air can't flow. But with a dome that's circular, the air flows around and it doesn't wow. leave those colds. Right. Yeah. So and then for and you, there's windows in them and doors. So that helps cool it. Some people put aquaponic systems in it. Uh, we do have a couple of people that specialize in it that are within our movement for those people that want to do that. And that would keep a humidity high. So you can grow bananas and mangoes and pepper and, you know, all of these things. And you can grow trees and shrubs in it. Like there's no limit because of um, the structure itself. It, it maintains a really decent temperature. Uh, all the way around, like there's not um, so much fluctuation. It almost reminds me of an igloo, you know, and the, exactly. probably exactly. designed that in that round sort of bubble sort yeah. of way to keep, you know, things consistent temperature wise. Are they easy to build? Right. Are they easy to put together? Oh yeah, absolutely, right. absolutely. So our method uses a beveled wood method because we're trying to eliminate as much tools and things that we possibly need. So it's basically a puzzle. They're all, we, uh, like they're all coded and stuff like that. So A goes into A, 
Um, and because these domes are built in triangle sections, you can replace, let's say if a piece of plastic did rip, you could just replace the plastic on that one triangle. You don't have to replace the whole thing. But we used to have a textile company, which was Mensadora, making reusable period pads and bladder pads for um, individuals in need. And uh, because of that, we have all of this textile uh, experience. We want to also branch out this fall and be able to cover the domes in canvas. So that's almost like a canvas tent for those that might be potentially displaced due to housing issues or wanting to build off grid or all kinds of circumstances. Um, so you can uh, use these domes for a lot of things. And, um, it, and we, it will allow us to grow even in our cooler winters here in Canada? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, Excellent. absolutely. And some people can't actually have domes where they are like and that's just how it is so what we'll be doing for those is teaching them how to use cold frames which is basically just a big rectangle and you can use a coffee table glass or a window and you can grow winter and or you can grow veggies like kales and and leafy greens in the deep snow in northern ontario you can wow. grow year round so yeah. And it's just about, yeah yeah just go ahead it's just about oh i love that that we can have you know access to that you know if there is a food shortage or some issue around food that's the vegetable the kind of vegetables that i'd be going after you know and growing right you know just right. for and i mean even exactly yeah and sprouting so sprouting yeah. is just seeds you, you can get tons of seeds they require next to no water and no light and you can have fresh veg if you do it on rotation every single day and it, it grows within anywhere from three days to seven days and it doesn't take up a lot of space. So this is highly nutritious. Some are more nutrient dense than the actual plant, such as broccoli. Mm. So there's lots of options for people to make sure that they can eat, but they need the skills to do it. And they sometimes might need the actual item and the seeds. And that's what we're here for working with the hubs as well. Excellent. So, you know, the world's gone through so much change these past, what, 18 months. Uh, and, and it doesn't seem to be abating. Um, and we as a species don't always uh, have the stamina to make change. And especially the changes you want to assist with, uh, Sarah. What, what do you say to the uh, person or to that idea that change can be rewarding for those who are change averse? Well, you know, I think, I think some people are still like in that position of fear. Right. And some people are really in a position of denial still. So I think a lot of people right now are scared to even admit what's happening or to even really look at what's going on. Um, so they're just they're constantly stuck in this spiral that I'll say like a downward spiral. Right. And I think that that's one of our our huge issues is people are afraid to change. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of great things that have happened in society over the last little while, a lot of technology but we have to learn to not be so lazy. And I think that that's the, one of the biggest change issues that people have is we've grown to be too convenient with stuff, right? Like it's more convenient to buy stuff and just open it up in a can or, or you know, go to the grocery store versus the work it takes to till the soil, to, to water the plants and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think that it's a lot to do with laziness by, by, uh, by design though. It's been designed that way for us. I'm oh not, yeah, for sure. People are lazy, but it's been designed over the last like 20 years to create this this uh, lazy behavior. Yeah. And, you know, like I, I, I made light and showed my cell phone, but, you know, even yeah. there, I mean, it, it knows the words I want to put down. Right? Um, right. So it's like I don't even have to think. And I, I don't like that. I think we, you know, we, we should be thinking. We should be researching. We should have dialogue. We should have new ways mm -hmm. and of doing things that's what this show is all about you know that's what we're doing here and what you're doing and, and i also want to tap into this the other key um uh to what you're, you're you're inspiring us to think about is is this idea of food and and that it's natural and healthy and i'm going to quote your website we will be teaching and offering support uh come harvesting seasons so you can get the most of your gardens. Learning how to grow food and tailor our diets to facilitate a strong immune system while producing it in a clean, chemical-free manner will help us be the healthiest version of ourselves. So um, a couple of things here. We all know that companies like Monsanto, they grow GMO foods and some of the veggies and fruits that we get at the grocery store that you, you, we already just spoke about may have been tampered with, you know, 
-hmm. uh, not to mention the use of pesticides and chemicals. Um, and what their goal is to get more out of the crops and, and what they farm. So what, what what's your take on that? And, and what changes do you feel need to be made in how we grow food, be it in our own communities, in our backyards, or at, at you know, you know, in a larger scale? What what right, what right. changes do you feel need to be well, made? Well, I think one thing. I think one thing that we've lost sight of is that year, like centuries ago, we used to eat what was available to us in the area. And that helped us for all kinds of reasons, including allergies, bees would pollinate the plants and we would eat those particular plants. So that's one reason why I believe that we see a lot more allergies now than before. So I think eating what is grown locally is always your best bet. One of the things we do with our domes is we give everybody a vermicomposting system as well. So that's turning worm poop into fertilizer. Here at the Eagle Homesteader, we actually human manure as well, which um, is sometimes a touchy subject for people, but we actually take all human feces and it gets converted into compost. It's perfectly fine and used in all kinds of other countries. It's just that we find that in Canada, especially people are often um, grossed out by some of the practices that have been going on in other countries for since the very beginning. And we learned that in Mexico and Vietnam that these kind of practices are very uh, much more healthier and can sustain more gardens and stuff like that, especially with unusual growing situations and things like that. As far as like chemicals and fertilizers, I mean, that's that's the problem. And one of the things that they that has happened is it, it makes it hard to seed save with the stuff that you eat. So if you're going to the grocery store and you're trying to save your squash seeds, because that's the thing, every day that we're eating fresh vegetables, there's a potential for a seed collection happening there that that's a missed opportunity because what's happening is, is the plant or the seeds are just getting thrown out. And if you're buying GMO or modified vegetables, those seeds may sprout, but they're not going to actually produce the fruit or the flower or whatever it is that you're trying to grow. So it's breaking that cycle of what we used to do, where you would grow a row just for seed saving for the next year. And this is one of those things going back to getting back to these kind of like pioneer kind of concepts and thinking. And also um, one of the things we do is we are working with uh, farmers for gleaning. So basically once they take off what they want, we can go in and take the stuff that we want that's left over um, instead of having it get kind of tilled over and go to waste. But we've also got this thing where food has to look perfect. We've come into this Instagram kind of like Pinterest like idea of what an apple should look like or a tomato or whatever. And then anything else seems ugly when it's perfectly healthy food. So there's a lot of food waste happening too with this, with this disconnect. So I think one of the things we have to do is get back to the food that we eat locally, that's grown locally, and go back into like the seed saving process that we do ourselves. Um, the nice thing about the greenhouses with the geodomes is that it does limit some of the spray off if there's spray in the area and things like that because it's an enclosed dome. So it does reduce the risk of having like aerial fertilizers and pesticides uh, inadvertently end up on your produce. Wow. We're with Sarah uh, Phoenix from Echo Homesteader. She's joining us from her home in New Liskard, Ontario. Um, I mentioned, you know, this idea of change being a, a challenge. And the other thing I want to, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask this, is that not everybody's into growing. You know, I don't have that skill set. So that would be a big uh, learning curve to a point that it might, you know, it might uh, deter me, deter me from it. Right. So what yeah. about, you know, it, this isn't for everybody. So who who would be sort of that ideal um, you know, what do, what do we call it? You know, the, the first, yeah, ideal candidate, right. the first to market, you know, the, the, the right. early adopters kind of thing. Who, who would that be? Would it, would it be like landscapers, gardening companies, uh, the guy yeah. who cuts your lawn, like, would that be one well, way to go? I think that right now, Right now we have over a thousand ap applications for domes. For the hmm. most part, they're people with um, a back, they're just trying to like support their family. But if we go back to what I was saying about like history, look at history, we didn't have everyone be farmers. We had blacksmiths that specialized in blacksmithing. We had like, you know, uh, animal husbandry, they specialized in that. So we that's part of this thing. Can everyone have a green thumb? Not necessarily, some people are better than others, but that's why we create the hubs and the villages. So that ideally um, we're looking for hubs that potentially have access to a large portion of land. So they will grow food for the whole area. And, you know, 
Is there a bit of a learning curve? Absolutely. I'm pretty sure everybody can sprout though. All you need to do is, you know, add some water. So there are some things you can be doing and there's other ways you can contribute kind of to this like bartering, bartering and trading kind of setup, which is actually going to be one of the components of our new platform that we're launching on Monday. It'll be like a barter and trade section. Um, the platform itself does not allow any, um, like cash currency for anything. Uh, any sort of advertisement is not allowed. It's simply trading of skills or trading of um, items. And it's kind of going back to that. You don't have to specialize in it. Um, you will have a skill that would utilize, could be utilized to your community. And then in return, you would get the food that you know isn't so much your skill. But right now they're families, they're farmers, they're just everyday people um, looking for some information, especially because we have such good support that we're offering it's not as scary to someone that perhaps has never done it before. So you ask, um, you know, people when you log onto your website and you mentioned it at the top to join the rebellion, in what ways can individuals assist you to make this happen? Well, I think some of the main things you can do right now is to pledge your dollar to change and commitment to stand and, you know, survive and thrive. The other thing when we launch on Monday, it's to join the platform. This platform looks just like Facebook, but it is fully uncensored. It is ran by us, created by us, and it is where we will do all of our teaching. Uh, if you're familiar with the Facebook platform, you get to create a profile and there'll be all of our like, um, there'll be groups such as like grade one homeschooling and all of these people have came together to create content or um, all kinds of things like that, where you can connect with people in your hub. So joining that platform would be critical because it allows us to start this ball rolling, getting these communities created and the information that we need out. The other thing that we're always looking for too, are for things that you might have laying around that you don't need. So some key things we need are like a tractor, um, snowmobiles, ATVs, or trucks. And this is so we can haul the wood out of the woods and get them milled. They don't have to be working. We have mechanics that have been donating their time. We use some of the, the money that we raise to, to get the parts or stuff like that on wholesale. And we even have people that are willing to go pick stuff up that have flat bed trailers and stuff. So that's another way. Or to donate your skills to the group. So there's tons of ways. We just want you to get involved. That's it. Um, find what you love and then give it to us freely. I love it. And, and, and it, wouldn't that be a nice you know, way to work, right? Um, so, yeah, so, would you take on then landscapers and garden companies as well? Would you tap into oh, those sure. circles? Because that to me is like your, a natural sort of environment, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody that wants to help us, like we, we, there's no ego here. We are more than willing to stand shoulder to shoulder with anybody and help anyone. And, and you know what I mean? Like, we are just, we're here to do whatever it takes to make sure people's needs are met. And it means being innovative. And that could mean like, um, you know, using our wholesale contract or, or, you know, looking for donations. We have a couple nonprofits that we can flow through grants as a social enterprise that's not usually uh, accessible to us for, for certain grants, but they're allowing us to flow through and use their nonprofit status number, which is a very common practice in social enterprise. So we're totally open to joining forces. And I have tons of collaborations happening. We basically have connections from Sault Ste. Marie all the way to Windsor um, right now of like all of these little hubs being created and other provinces are reaching out, looking to recreate what we're doing. I would love to be able to do all the provinces. It's just too much work for us. So if there was another person that wanted to take it on, we would duplicate and just hand everything that we do over for their province. Who, who inspired you? I should have asked this at the beginning, but who inspired you to do this? Because this is a humongous undertaking, but such a big, bold, beautiful vision, too. Well, you know, I think I, and I actually have thought about this because I've had I've been asked this before, and I actually think it's been my parents, which is which is a really strange thing because you don't think about that all the time. But growing up, my dad was the original rebel. He was the original, like trying to help people, um, even though he came off as being really rough around the edges. He grew up in a very challenging household. Um, he was starving a lot of the time. So he, food security was an issue for him. And then, you know, over especially my teenage years, they were always there for people and just going above and beyond. And I think that's kind of really what started a lot of my uh, learned behaviors is just to give selfishly and not really look for anything in return. So I think that kind of started it, but 
I also do it for me because it makes me feel good. And in the end, you know, that's what's important is, is to, I feel like I've been given so many amazing opportunities and I love my life and I love my family that I just want to share it. And in return, more amazing things happen. It's like filling my cup. Um, but I would say that my, my parents for sure um, really set the foundation to be able to give freely. And I hope I can do that with my son, who's uh, he's 16 now. And I hope he can really see that just you don't need stuff in return, trying to break that cycle that teenagers often have right now with devices and things like that, that um, supporting your community and stuff is like what can actually make a huge change in the world. Mm. And let me ask you too, do you have a spiritual uh, practice or, you know, is this tied into your, you know, any any sort of personal spiritual upbringing that you had as well? Because this is like very... it is a very spiritual journey for sure yeah Yeah. um so growing up we never really grew up in a religious household it wasn't until um when I was in my late 30s when I went back to University of Western for medical sciences that's how I actually got the name Phoenix because I rose from a very challenging situation and uh someone that was helping me through it started calling me the Phoenix and that's how it's always kind of stuck um but around that time I, I did start looking into you know this kind of like intuition and and looking at my trauma because trauma kind of flows when you grow up in a situation with trauma then you know that usually happens to your children so I was really looking at ways to heal myself and along that way I found out that I'm more powerful than than I thought and that I have the ability to control my thoughts and the environment around me and when I really looked at my trauma and really began to understand it I don't, I don't believe you have to forgive your trauma. That's my opinion. I I think you have to understand it, but it doesn't need to be forgiven. And when I came to this conclusion, it made me realize that we are more than what we seem, right? Like this is really, for me, I believe a big experiment uh, is why we're here. We're here to see if that we can change and, and how human behavior um, changes uh, through the courses of time you know, like such as a reincarnation sort of, I guess, practice, like learning and learning. And that comes from some of my work with the Buddhist monks in Vietnam. I was working with female Buddhist monks um, in Vietnam. And that's really when I started to really dive into this spiritual practice. I do meditation every night and, and I do try to just try to listen to my own inner voice. And that's how a lot of my decisions for Eco Homesteader is made. It's like, do I do this? Yes or no, right? And I think that we've lost track of the ability that we know what is right and what is wrong. We know what is truth and what is a lie. We've just stopped listening to it. So I think that's another part of the eco homesteader is we are trying to teach people as well to start to listen to your own inner thoughts and stop being affected so much by you know the outside world that we are all more powerful than we can possibly imagine. Yeah, no, that's that's beautiful, and it does. It, it, you know, it's just wisdom of the ages. What, what, whether mm-hmm. whether you're Buddhist, you know, Kabbalist, uh, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, you know, it's it's like do unto the others as you would do, you know, as you you know, Absolutely. as you would yourself, or love yeah. love your neighbor as you would thyself. It's just common sense. If we all did that, like this mm-hmm. place would be a, a lot different, and we we've kind of fallen off Absolutely. the mark a little bit. Um, you know, yeah. um, I, I pray that we make the shift in ending division and people coming together in the spirit of oneness and community. You know, I go on my walks in my neighborhood. I'm in a residential neighborhood in North York. And even in these times, people don't even say hello back to you. And yeah. uh, and and so many of us are feeling isolated right now. I mean, we, we've been forced isolation on us, which is I won't even get to that, but, um, (laughs) you know, these 18 months, you know, uh, have really taken a toll on us and that need for a human connection. And I I'd like to see, you know, love and community and harmony and working together take shape big time. Um, and I really admire you for what you're doing and, and this great work. Where do we reach you to learn more? And what are the, the websites? Where do we, where do we connect Mm -hmm. with you? So the best way right now until our platform launches on Monday is uh, www.ecohomesteader.ca. Uh, that's where you can apply for your dome. You can uh, you can donate your skills. You can get information about our One Voice Pledge. 
as well as when the platform launches probably Monday evening, we're waiting for our Starlink, so we have some better internet out here in off grid, um, then we will be launching, I'm thinking probably around seven o'clock on Monday. And then that'll be the go-to having people join there because that's where everybody will be able to connect uncensored. Uh, I mean, the internet, you still have to be careful, but at least this kind of platform isn't gonna be, un is not going to be censored because we are running, managing and like web hosting all of it. So. That's the best way to reach out to us right now. We are really swamped with messages. So we do try to get back to people as soon as possible. And I do reach out to every single person personally um, because I really want people to feel like they're important and they're connected. So if someone is trying to reach out, we just need a little bit of time. I gotcha. Um, for all those uh, watching, listening, I hope you enjoyed uh, our, our time with Sarah Phoenix today. Thank you for being a part of RISE. Our goal is really to inspire individuals like you to rise up, uh, which is what RISE is all about. Rise up, inspire, make an impact, be socially aware, and continue the entrepreneurial spirit to make life and the world a bit better. Next week, we're gonna welcome Cheryl Martin as we talk about how trauma can be either a catalyst for change or continue to disrupt your life, it's your choice. And um, it not only does it disrupt your life, but it disrupts your work, your relationships, your business. Um, Sarah, I, I, I just wanna thank you so much for this today. You've been a great guest and I, I just wish you much success and uh, thank you, yeah. Great. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for giving us the ability and the platform to be able to share our message and to stand shoulder and shoulder to us. What, what a joy. Again, that was Sarah Phoenix, and she joined us from her bus. They redirect, uh, redecorated and redid a bus uh, uh, and outfitted it so that you can live and work in it, right? Which is pretty incredible. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and it's going to be turned into a mobile grocery store once we can ret retrofit it oh, cool. so that we can actually move it and get it to areas that perhaps are struggling for food. This way, we'll be able to get them the things that they need. Wow. Wow. Okay. So much going on. And, and <laughs> I, know, I, don't know where, on I don't know when you find you know, time to sleep. But yeah, again, uh, Sarah, thank you so much. And until next week, I'm your host, David Cohen. We'll see you next week with our guest, Cheryl Martin. Sarah Phoenix, thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.